Greetings, dear friends. Today in the Alatra TV studio, we have the esteemed Igor Mikhailovich Danilov. Greetings. And Jana. Greetings. And Tatiana. Thank you, greetings. Let's introduce her at least once, because she always introduces us, but we have never introduced her. Thank you. Igor Mikhailovich, Jana. Some people who are just getting acquainted with the Alatra International Public Movement or who have superficial contact with the Alatra movement ask themselves, what is Alatra as the international movement? Yes, they understand that it's a huge worldwide movement, that Alatra engages in social projects, fundamental research and holds conferences with thousands of venues and interpreting into dozens of languages of the world. There are a lot of projects and areas in Alatra, including climate, medicine, scientific studies, research in physics, metaphysics, as well as IT, in particular the artificial consciousness Jackie. Here is another point. If various organizations, including religious organizations, some sects, fit everything under one scenario of some sort, under one ideology, and try to explicitly demonstrate their large scale, that's how big we are, what giants we are, by declaring the number of their participants, Alatra, on the contrary, acts according to some completely different principles. First of all, it is diverse and multifaceted from the scope of activities to the composition of the participants. And there is also a comparison that it's all sort of scattered around the world, a little bit here, a little bit there, but there is a little bit in every city of the world. And the bottom line is that Alatra is everywhere. In Alatra there are representatives of various religious denominations, people professing Zoroastrianism, Hinduism, Christianity, Islam, people who practice ancient power practices, people who believe in aliens, in shamanism, in voodoo. And among them there are plenty of atheists in Alatra who are digging into facts. So a layman has a question, what is actually going on? What kind of a motley mix is this? Hence, I was asked to address a question to you. So I'm asking you, Igor Mikhailovich, what is Alatra? Alatra is not a what. Alatra, my friends, is a who. Alatra is all of us. Alatra is humanity. That's what Alatra is. Just as in all of our humanity, in Alatra there is everyone. As you have already listed, there are Christians, Muslims, Buddhists, those who practice shamanism, and plenty of atheists. This is really so. Alatra is a new and unique phenomenon in general that has never existed in this world. This is indeed so. For some reason, they try to fit us into some kind of a pattern. After all, people's consciousness always tries to fit something new into some understandable framework, right? So they try to do the same to Alatra. Some people try to fit Alatra into some political trend, alleging that Alatra engages in geopolitics. Others try to fit Alatra into some religious trend, into a sect. So they say, it's some kind of a mixture of some strange religion, that it has a little bit of everything from everywhere, and it's as if something new, there are attempts to impose something on someone, and so on. Again, all this is happening because people observe Alatra superficially, as you have already said, and judge partly based on Alatra TV, on our videos, on what I say, or on what other people say. So, after familiarizing themselves with it a little bit, you know, after conducting sort of an analysis, as they say, well, the analysis is conducted, again, based on what they see and literally bit by bit from everywhere, without going into the essence of Alatra International Public Movement. Therefore, they make hasty and, I would say, wrong conclusions about what Alatra is. But Alatra is not a what. Alatra is a who. Alatra is all of humanity. It is diverse just like our entire humanity. After all, we are all different, right? Right. Everyone has their favorite politicians and their favorite performers. It's the same in Alatra. In Alatra there are politicians, representatives of different religions, I mean clergymen, and believers 
from all over the world. After all, today, as you have said, there is indeed not a single corner left where there are no representatives of Alatra. They are everywhere. Everywhere there are those who have understood the essence of what Alatra is and have joined in. Again, as of today, Alatra is objectively growing very fast. And the question is, why? I know that many are concerned, it's such a phenomenon. some are worried, and some are just wondering, what is so special about Alatra? And for some reason, a lot of people attribute this to me. They say that I'm kind of the leader of Alatra. Guys, there is no leader in Alatra. There is one leader in Alatra. It's a human being. And Alatra is, first and foremost, humanity. That's the essence of Alatra itself. And what is Alatra united on? A simple question. On humaneness. On that best which is in all of us. That is why there is no leader as such. No one is either superior or inferior. Alatra is something new. And I would say, it is so unique that today it's impossible to give it a definition of what it is. I understand that some people, again, based on superficial knowledge and patterns in their heads, will start attributing us to some organization, again, inventing some patterns for us like sect, politics, some geopolitical trend or something else. Guys, we already talked about this before. To be honest, we don't really care what you call us. But in each of you, there is that particle which reaches out to Alatra. This is indeed so. Because today, what is being discussed in Alatra and what unites everyone in Alatra, it unites even those people who haven't heard and aren't familiar with Alatra yet. But the time will come, and Alatra will be known to everyone, and Alatra will live in everyone. That is true. So, people from our whole number, and as of today, how many do we have? 7 billion and more than 800 million. Million. So, Alatra lives in more than 99%. Alatra is God's love, if we speak the language of religion. Again, why do we often use religious terms? Why do we talk a lot about God? Because who else is there to talk about, my friends? Because the reality is that today, out of those 7.8 billion people, 6.6 .6 billion are people who profess one or another religion. That's official. And in fact, all of us, even atheists, all of us feel that there is something something good. And even the worst among us who think, that's it, I'm so bad, I'm kind of sinful in everything, to the point that they deny God. And love for Him still lives in those of us who deny God, and hope for the best still lives, and we still want what is best. Even those who manipulate the masses just to elevate their crown, you know, to make a little money or something else. I mean, those few tyrants who remain in this world. They are human beings, just like us, and they have a lot of good and humane qualities too. It's just the conditions are such, the conditions of the consumerist format in which we all live. And there are these rules of the game here, which were imposed on us as humankind 6,000 years ago. They made us live precisely under such rules, where man is wolf to man, where the worst that is in us, in people, is dominant in society, and the world is built according to such bestial laws. Yes, we write beautifully and correctly, but we act not humanly. We act with hatred, with inhumanity towards each other, while internally, in reality, we seek love, joy and peace. We all want a good world, a peaceful world, don't we? And this understanding, this best, the best that people have, what is called humaneness, this is what precisely unites people in Alatra, and this is what we are united on. In Alatra, 
we have representatives of many different political trends. There are many politicians. There are a lot of politicians in different countries. There are many clergymen of various religions in our international public movement as well. But what unites us? A simple question. It is humaneness that unites us. We are united by what we call love for one another, or God's love. Isn't it so? All of us actually want good things. Everything passes. No matter what we do, no matter how we fight over someone else's territory to take something away from them, no matter how we pursue private, personal interests of some kind, everything will pass. It is clear that the situation itself, the very consumerist format, forces us to be deluded. However, Alatra is precisely that pure water, which washes off the stupidity of consciousness and which enables every person to breathe deeply and to live with love, to be a human. This is what unites. And the entire secret of Alatra is that we do our best. We learn to love each other, despite the fact that we are different. That's what the whole secret is about. Tell me, what is bad about loving each other, about respecting each other? I understand that some people might say, how can I love someone I hate? He is an enemy, and he has come to me. Friends of mine, if we don't learn to love each other, we won't learn to love God either. And if we don't learn to love God, what is the point of this life? In hatred? In filth? In domination? To live like animals? After all, animals live by domination. Why? Because they don't have a soul and don't have love. They only have consumption and struggle for power. But we are people, we are not animals. This is really so. And everyone knows this. More than 99% of people know and share this. And more than 99% of people want to live in such a society. And we must build it. This is not geopolitics. This is a need. This is what our prophets told us about. This is what they really wanted. And so we, an enormous mass of people, billions and billions of people, we supposedly live according to the Prophet's behests. But in actual fact, no, we don't live according to their behests. We live to the dictation of greed, to the dictation of lies, deception, pridefulness, and everything that is imposed on us by the consumerist format. Isn't it so? Yet, what do we want? We want simplicity. We really want a clear sky, peace in the whole world, love and respect for each other. We want to travel across the world with no worry and know that it is our world, not like here is my house and that's it, while that is my neighbor's house and I'm not allowed to enter it. In order to enter it, I need a bunch of papers or something else. Guys, you have to agree, it is stressful. We just want to live as one big family, to eliminate discord, to eliminate squabbles, simply to live, to live as the prophets bequeathed to us. Isn't that right? It is. And this very simple, natural desire to live like humans, to really live according to the behests of our prophets, this is exactly the essence of Alatra. And what can we call it? What kind of organization is it? Well, it is simply humanity. You cannot call it otherwise. I would say these very best qualities, the very best qualities of people, this is precisely the crystal lattice of the diamond itself, I would say, which is Alatra actually today. Yes, it has numerous facets, but the structure is one – humaneness. Great. I hope I've managed to answer your questions, friends. Igor Mikhailovich, can we eliminate some misunderstandings regarding the movement a bit more and ask you a couple of questions? That's the point. Why do we need misunderstandings? A simple question. Misunderstanding gives rise to conjectures. Some rejection, yes. Of course. For instance, why are some people afraid of Alatra or become suspicious? While there are people who look at Alatra and they almost… like hatred arises in them. 
Why? A simple question. Just a lack of understanding, first of all. A lack of knowledge and understanding. Yes. Something new always provokes suspicion. While in order to understand what Alatra is, one should look at it from the inside, not superficially, not from rumors. But look inside of it yourself. Then you will understand what Alatra is. Alatra is not some kind of a religious trend, where you will be told what food to get up with and that you should give everything away. This is foolishness, guys. And by what instructions to act? Absolutely right. In Alatra, there are no written instructions. There is just one. Love each other and be humans. That's the point. Also, when labels are pinned on Alatra, allegedly, Alatra believes in aliens. By the way, is this Alatra's official position or not? Or Alatra speaks about magic, the shadow control project on Alatra TV disturbs some people. Of course. Or the fact that Islam is discussed a lot. Is Alatra only for Muslims? You know, this question is interesting to me as well. Why? If we have talked, for example, about aliens, then that's it. It's the official position of Alatra that believes in aliens. Friends of mine, for you to understand, there are many people in Alatra who are really keen on ufology. There are people who saw unexplainable phenomena and understand that aliens actually exist. There are people who laugh at that and don't believe in aliens. Why? Because they themselves haven't encountered them. You know, it's like… I will give a simple example. In Israel there is the Dead Sea. Do you believe in it? I believe, but I don't know. I haven't been there. I haven't been there either. I haven't checked it personally. I haven't been there and haven't checked it either. So, should I now disbelieve that there is the Dead Sea in Israel? You know, I actually disbelieve that there is the Dead Sea there. Why? Because it is already alive. Fish have appeared there. And this is one of the things predicted in the past. It is actually a bad sign. But the fact remains a fact. That there is even no Dead Sea in Israel anymore. Because life has appeared there. Nonetheless, let's say, the dead alive sea, should we believe in it or not? We should check. Or should we check? If you doubt, you go ahead and check. You yourself study and then draw conclusions. But when you do it superficially, that's manipulation, banal manipulation. When people begin to solve their problems or simply have no one to vent their anger and inner filth at, so they try, you know, as people do that, to purify themselves and they pour filth on someone. When they pour it on me, that's fine, guys. What can you do? Such is life. But when they pour it on the entire Alatra movement, guys, this is actually entire humanity. How can you? Are you not ashamed of pouring filth on the entire humanity? On yourselves. After all, as of today, and Tatiana is right, Alatra is all over the world. The entire humanity is in Alatra. And this is important. There are representatives of the entire humanity, of all parties, all religions, representatives of all sciences. Isn't that so? It is. Also, some people try to superficially form their idea of Alatra International Public Movement based on Alatra TV. Guys, Alatra TV is only one of the little projects of Alatra International Public Movement. And it is impossible to draw any conclusions based on Alatra TV. It's just one little project that covers a very small part of what is being done by the participants of Alatra International Public Movement all over the world. This is really so. Again, which Alatra TV? We actually have plenty of Alatra TV in nearly all languages of the world, in various cities, countries, regions and districts. Based on which Alatra TV do people draw conclusions when they watch it? A simple question. In which language? Thank you. Isn't that so? Also, Igor Mikhailovich, there are certainly no analogues of such movement as Alatra in the world. And many people really try to figure out this phenomenon of Alatra. They understand how quickly growing this movement is. Indeed, as you already answered, people have questions as to what attracts people so much. They say that Alatra is like an iceberg. The top is visible, while the major part of what is happening cannot be seen. Of course, there are many questions which you have answered a little bit earlier regarding what attracts people in Alatra so much. But they also wonder where Alatra's money comes from, because monthly provision for such an organization costs millions and millions of dollars, according to their minimal estimations.
What does it mean? Millions and millions. And who counted? It is somehow… Igor Mikhailovich, the question is acute. Where does the money come from? They say that Alatra has more money than the Vatican. All intelligence services of the world are searching because Soros, for example, wouldn't have enough money to organize and support such a tremendous movement as Alatra. It is said that, for instance, production of only one film, Atlantis, the elite in search of immortality, costs more than one million dollars. And if we talk about a more large-scale project, such as the Universal Grain, the estimated cost of this project, according to United Nations pricing, is tens of millions of dollars. So the question is straightforward. Where is the money from? God gives it. I understand that for people who don't even believe in God, this answer is somewhat tricky. But, you know, as a matter of fact, God actually gives it. He sends inspiration to some people, and a person gives rise to some project, an idea of the project itself. To others, he sends an opportunity to implement it. Right? Well, those very funds. Right. And to still others, he sends enthusiasm, order, and willingness to execute it, and the project is born. Isn't that so? It is. Therefore, friends, no matter how funny it looks, it is actually God who gives it. God gives us life, God gives us opportunities, those opportunities which we implement not for ourselves, but for people, for making the Prophet's dream come true, for something good. That's when, indeed, God helps everyone who wants to do and does what is good, not those who accumulate for themselves and deprive poor people of the last penny. Those get help from the devil, from Satan. But it's not for long, it is temporary. They know this, that's why they are so embittered. While to normal people, God gives. That's why each of them does what they can. Someone generates ideas, someone helps financially with that very money, while someone goes ahead and implements. That's where the money is from. Yet, what's the point? Just tell me. I understand people's question. I honestly understand it. And indeed, all services of the world have been searching for our money. This is true. And they continue searching. And the first thing which sounds is that Alatra is a sect that has a lot of money, and the money is supplied to them. Some say this country supplies, others say it's that country. Well, you know, such a fight is going on. And they throw it at each other, like in badminton with this. Racket. Racket, yes. Back and forth. Right. They throw a shuttlecock back and forth. The same as shuttlecock, yes. So Alatra is like a shuttlecock. It's a project of these secret services, it's a project of those secret services, some said it's Soros idea, and so on. Guys, we don't mind. If you want to help, just help. Even that very Soros invests a lot, a lot in good as well. A lot? I don't know it what else. Some people say that he invests in some political movements, but on the other hand, if he as a person wants to do at least something great and good, well, why not support, let's say, the Alatra movement? We actually don't mind. It's just that, do you know what the point is? The point is that no organizations and no countries help us. I am saying this with regret. It is really so. Would funds do any harm? They wouldn't. We could do more. But we ourselves, we people, solve these issues ourselves. We don't actually do it like other organizations do. We don't collect money and don't accumulate it, because we know that it is pointless to collect valuables somewhere where a thief breaks in, or someone comes and takes it away, or, pardon me, it just disappears. At Alatra, we accumulate the highest values the true wealth, derived from the Russian word «богатырить», meaning to accumulate God, to accumulate His love. This is the highest value. And again, we have already said, Alatra is all of humanity, and no matter how you twist it, everything belongs to humanity. That's where the money comes from. The most important and the main thing is that many of us do it all just from the heart, in our free time, 
at our own expense, even at a loss, so to speak. But we do for people. And you know, when you act this way, you actually feel good inside, you feel better inside when you have spent time not on lying on the couch or going, I don't know, hunting with men, shooting animals, drinking vodka or playing cards, you know, an ordinary man's life, but actually on communicating with friends, talking about good things, about love. And the meaning of life is much more pleasant than killing someone, even if it is just a hair. What harm has it done to me? Why should I kill it? After all, I am sated. And since I am sated, why would I want anything in excess? Isn't that so? That's the point. And that's what unites. The truth and love is what unites. And when there is love, truth and friends, you don't need money. We do everything ourselves. It is true. However, money really plays a huge role in the consumerist format nowadays. No one is saying that money is bad. No. Sometimes people do bad things to get this money. But that's what Alatra is distinguished for. We try to do good and in the right way. And our earnings, we don't, pardon me, act like everyone else. That is, everything is just for oneself. We share with people. And it feels good. Yes, indeed. It has been scientifically and experimentally proven that altruism actually helps much more to a person who seeks to help another person, and last of all, to the one whom he helps. And now Jana has told us the biggest secret, the secret of humaneness, which is concealed from us. If you want to be happy, make other people happy, then you will also be happy. This is the only path to happiness. If you want to be loved, love others. Begin to love really love other people and help them. And you will be loved, this is true. No one likes evil, wicked, nasty, greedy and bad people. Yes, some people toady, they envy him if he holds some position or something else in society, as they say. But a person actually lives by hatred, he lives in filth, and he understands this. It makes him even angrier. Well, is it really life when you are angry, when you are afraid of something, when you feel bad, it's not life. Life is joy. Life is love. Life is life. Yes, it is really so. In fact, hedonistic pleasures eventually bring only depression, because when a person acts only out of selfishness, for his own benefit, he chooses some video games, some entertainment, which do not bring any essence for life, for something that can really please him as personality, meaning to fill him up internally. Sometimes it is such a waste of time, the time which is wasted in vain. Do you know what the most valuable in this world is? Jana once said, it is time. That is true. There is nothing more valuable than time. It is running out and doesn't return. We can earn back the money we spent. If we gave something to someone, it may return to us, but time will never return. So wasting it on what is empty means to simply dissipate your life. When you could do something good at the time, you can do something at least for yourself, can study something new, learn about something you didn't know before. But the most important thing is to help someone, even to talk to people. Some people say, what is a conversation? Well, I've talked to people, so what? What's the point? It depends on what you are talking about, my friend. If you talk to people about kindness, about love, if you manage to step over yourself, over your pridefulness and your fear, a lot of people are actually afraid to start talking to people. Why? Especially on the topics like love, peace, mutual respect and the creative society. Isn't it so? A fear arises. Will I be understood or not? Yet, who speaks in you? And who holds you back? Just start, and you will see that it is wonderful, right? Instead of just wasting your life, pick up the phone, call a friend and talk to him or her, have a conversation, especially to someone you don't want to talk to. That's the best option. You don't want to talk to someone not because he's your enemy or something else, but because you just don't want to. You know, such antipodes. 
Why? Because we don't know each other. That's what our problem is. We only live by a superficial perception of each other. You know, we are actually like animals. We look at external aggression, we become aggressive ourselves, and we separate one another. But throw off wolf masks and talk to each other like human beings. After all, there is both a beast and an angel in a human. Talk to an angel and be an angel, and a beast will move away. Yes, in the beginning a beast may manifest, because he sees your image, and he has the same attitude as you had towards him. But when he understands that you treat him without evil, when you treat him with love as a human being, my friends, how can someone not perceive it? Unless he is totally crazy, or someone who, excuse me, clings to Satan, or to his tail, or to his horns. But those of you, they are less than 1%. Again, God really gives opportunities to people, but He gives these opportunities so that they use them not for themselves, but for other people. Then it is wonderful, then it is splendid. Thus, God gives opportunities to that very Alatra for doing what we actually do, and we do it for everyone, for all people, regardless of religion or political views. This is wonderful, and this is splendid. And just imagine, let's suppose if our organization became like other organizations. For instance, our international public movement would start engaging in profiteering, building factories, buying sheep. Well, such a… then this Alatra wouldn't be worth a dime, right? And despite the fact that it has such a high-flown name and a beautiful guise, well, it would be another, pardon me, consumerist machine. So, what's the point? But, thank God, we, the people of Alatra, actually stand guard, so that Alatra remains like a breath of fresh air, like, excuse me, a glass of clear spring water in this world that is filled with not what we would like it to be filled with. Therefore, we must do our best to ensure that fresh air and clear water accessible to everyone, would be all over the world, as well as God's love for everyone without limitations. Thank you. Indeed, opportunities are given to people, to those who place other people before themselves, and that's when these opportunities do not run out. But as soon as a person puts himself before people, opportunities actually disappear. The devil can surely give him something, but that's something different. And the difference is huge. Right. Also, people come up with the question. Again, it is really so joyful that many people already act. They surprise and inspire other people to act. So, a question is asked, how is it actually possible to stimulate people so that they act for such a long time, with such an enthusiasm and such a responsibility, such a responsible approach to what they do. Because, for example, certain companies or organizations have entire special divisions and HR departments that invent various methods of how to stimulate people to act. While here, such a tremendous gratitude to people for their inspiration and such an example. Yet, there is also one question regarding an organizational point. In large corporations, everything usually boils down to a certain individual, to one owner of some kind. So, people wonder, as for Alatra International Public Movement, it is so multifaceted and multivectored. How can one person rule this entire gigantic structure? Just name this person for me. For instance, some people will point at me and say that it's me. No, friends, I absolutely don't rule and don't have any relation to ruling Alatra, just like anyone else. This is true. Nobody rules Alatra. Alatra is unique. There is no one who dictates here, and there cannot be. Alatra lives on its own, it is life. Who rules people's life? Tell me. Well, there are fellows who try to rule and manipulate our behavior, driving us into limits of one or another kind. But again, it is done through laws and everything else. And we, as law-abiding citizens, are obliged to comply with certain laws. Well, 
and many other things. However, guys, this is manipulation over our external, while I am talking about the inner life, about our, that, which gives life. Who rules it? A simple question. We ourselves coordinate each other's actions, yes. In this case, what relates to the Alatra movement? Alatra is self-organizing. I have already given an example. There is a person who has got an idea, it has been supported and implemented. There is responsibility. This is true. There are coordination centers. What are coordination centers and what are they needed for? For coordination and interaction of people all over the world. This is transfer of information and concurrence of certain actions. By no means should this be associated with politics, with geopolitics or something else. Guys, those of you in whom such thoughts arise, just relax. Alatra is beyond politics and has no intention to go there. We don't need politics. This is true. Don't worry and don't be afraid. We are no competition for any politicians. In Alatra there are a lot of people who support some politicians, while others support other politicians. However, inside Alatra no political debates are held. Everyone chooses whom they want. And we are united based on something else, on humaneness. And there is no hierarchy in Alatra, and there cannot be. But there are responsible persons. What does a responsible person mean? It's not a substitution for a chief by any means. It is, for example, when people begin to implement a certain project, and there is a person responsible for its implementation. He is exactly responsible for ensuring that people who are hanging on Satan's tail, or on his horns, or, pardon me, are deeply in his anus, wouldn't get in. But the anti alatra in order to shift this movement, doesn't matter in what country, towards some political decision for somebody's benefit. So, responsible persons are actually needed for ensuring that there is no manipulation on the part of people who have lost conscience, have lost honor, have lost everything humane. But they are sly, deceitful, you know, of such a kind, and they try to manipulate. So, in order to eliminate manipulation, in order for Alatra not to be turned into another sect or religion, and what is a sect or religion? As a rule, it's a code of certain rules, Monopoly on the truth. Monopoly on the truth, while everything else is rejected. Alatra doesn't fit into such images. Why? Because we said, we have religions of the entire world. They are in Alatra. And no one should dictate to anyone, forbid or something else. Yes, we are all together, we try to get to the bottom of the truth. Don't we? We do. But there are responsible persons. And these responsible persons, who are in every project, who are in coordination centers, these are people, these are all of us. Also, we, all participants of the international public movement, are responsible for ensuring that what has already repeatedly happened on this planet named Earth, which all of us live on, wouldn't happen to Alatra. So that it wouldn't happen that the truth would be altered for the benefit of some organization. When a certain organization monopolized this truth and altered it for its own convenience, in order to become a powerful organization. When the truth was replaced with something completely opposite to what the Prophet had said. And later on, this opposite was imposed on the minds of the followers of this organization. This is what mustn't happen. We mustn't roll down from higher values, from our humanness to what is beastly. We mustn't take it all and eventually turn it into some really a geopolitical movement with the purpose of conquering the world or something else. You know, as a matter of fact, only people who have ceased to be people, only they can think this way and allow that. However, the temptation is strong. It is strong for many people, and we have seen it in many countries. We saw attempts of manipulation. We saw it when people tried to incline to one or another party. We saw how various groups of people tried, let's put it mildly, to entice participants to their side, when they had such a serious struggle for power. But Alatra is wonderful, because there is freedom of religious beliefs and freedom of political choice in it. Just like 
all over the world. As long as politics exists, people have the right to elect and to vote for anyone they like, for anyone they consider worthy of their votes. As long as there is politics, as long as there is the consumerist format, yet we, together, strive to implement the dream of the Prophet, of all the Prophets. Igor Mikhailovich, we speak of getting to the bottom of the truth. You mentioned the prophets. Let's approach this topic a little bit. The thing is that some people have a dissonance because if we talk about the prophets, about the Son of God, yes. about those who came into this world, they simultaneously spoke about the flourishing of humankind, about the Golden Age, about millennia of happy life, and at the same time they spoke about the end of times. Right. about the Armageddon. So, there is also a lack of understanding regarding this point. Is it possible to bring some clarity here too? Yes, misunderstanding arises among people, because our prophets, and I want to say it right away, all the prophets who came are all ours. They came from one God, and they came to the whole humanity. That's why all the prophets are ours. And this is indeed so. Prophets could not bring different truths. They brought one truth. That truth was always simple. And the essence of it was exactly what we call the creative society today. But prophets said that humanity will come to a certain time when it will face a choice and when we will have two ways. One way is, excuse me, what we call the last hour, the judgment, the apocalypse. And the second one is millennia of life, of a happy life, like in paradise or golden millennia. Yes. These are the two ways. At this point a dissonance arose among many people, among those who studied and actually tried to understand one or another religion. And both ways are mentioned, both the good and the bad one. So, a question arises here. Why is there what leads to death, the bad? And why is there also what leads to life, the good? And how is it? First there will be something good, and then there will be something bad. But it is actually said about the judgment, when everyone will die and no one will stay here. Alive ones will go to alive ones, dead ones will simply die, and so on. But what about the golden millennium? While all this confusion, my friends, arises because someone once altered the words of the prophets, usurped the truth, and then they told fairy tales from their minds, just children's tales, because something had to be told and it had to be explained. And that's where this confusion came from. Eventually, people who try to understand their religion, believers, come to an understanding that something is wrong. Because yes, there are religious fanatics, I'll digress a little, who believe and they forbid themselves to think differently. They act the way they are told, in order to be saved. And they sweep everything away. They feel that something is wrong, but they forbid themselves to even think about it. But everyone can actually feel where the truth is and where lies are where fairy tales are and where the reality is. I will give a simple example. Let's talk a little bit about this, expand it a little bit, so that our friends can understand what we are talking about. For example, how will people rise from the dead? Because it is said, they will rise in their bodies, right? That's the way it is said, right? Yes, from the ashes. And what is our vision? That there will be judgment. the last judgment. God will sit on a throne. On a throne, yes. In Christianity, it will be Jesus Christ. He will return. On one side, there will be acquitted. And he will judge. It is sort of the second advent of Jesus Christ on earth. It will be the universal judgment, and so on. Friends, I will gradually clarify, clarify the dissonance which arises in every one of us, those who try to figure this out. Those who are in doubt with thinking at least a little bit, and not just believe in what they are told, because those who simply believe don't actually believe in anything, they want to appear, but not to be. While those who feel that there is something, they search for it, and they look into it. You see? For example, when a person is looking for gems, he takes them, touches them, washes them, 
and distinguishes them. Otherwise, it is possible to collect simple stones. For instance, why would you need a slate if you are looking for emeralds? That's how people act. They take one thing, they touch another thing, and look. And so the question arises, how will we all rise in our bodies, right? And another question arises, what about and who said it, violating the words of Jesus Christ himself? Yes. Because Jesus Christ didn't say he would come here again, did he? Recall, what did he say? He said he would send another one, but he didn't say that he would come to judgment and would judge. That was invented by people already. And those conjectures and attempts to explain it, they simply erased the truth. They substituted it. And fairy tales came to us, which we don't understand. And what the Prophet told about, what Jesus Christ told about, it is all forgotten and erased. But it was true. So, what else is the point? Man rose in a body from the dead by the will of God. Yes, anything is possible to God. But I have another question. In each of us, in you two, friends, there are particles of millions of people who lived before you. There are particles of distant stars and everything else. Now imagine, millions of subpersonalities, the dead ones, have risen and taken their particles back. I have a simple question. What will you be standing on during the judgment? And what will you look like? Or does God have to make something different? While it is said, you will rise from your ashes, right? Yes. You shall turn into ashes, you shall rise from ashes. Meaning, what is mine must return to me. Clearly, particles do not disappear. Friends, yes, I understand. Some of them live for a short period of time, while others live and exist for a very long time. Therefore, they don't vanish anywhere. And in us, in our bodies, there are masses of bodies of other people, animals, creatures, and everything else. Igor Mikhailovich, you have touched upon such an interesting topic of Judgment Day, because there are so many misunderstandings, I mean… Indeed, there are many misunderstandings. We are trying to figure out what is wrong here and why. Do you know what else I want to say? My friends, the after-death fate is precisely a tool for speculation used by all religious organizations. The greatest speculation occurs exactly on this aspect of the after-death fate. However, people did know about this, and they knew it not so long ago. But afterwards, it all became altered, concealed and usurped by organizations, sort of, you cannot come to God without an intermediary, and so forth. Well, let's look into it, since our friends are interested. In particular, there was a misunderstanding about this on the part of a Christian woman who grew up in the Orthodox tradition, because Jesus Christ said that the alive ones do not come to judgment. Specifically, in the Gospel of John, the following is mentioned. Very truly, I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged. I mean, very clear words. Look, Jesus Christ said this. But what was said afterwards? That they have life. That all would come and all would be judged. Yes, that they will be divided. But some will be taken to heaven, while others to hell. Yes, eternal torment and afterwards eternal life. Guys, I just have... You know, a simple question always arises for me. Who gave people the right to twist and alter the words of Jesus Christ? Or other prophets? Yes, in Islam. Everywhere. This is also mentioned, actually, that alive ones do not come for judgment, that only dead ones will be judged. All God's messengers tell the same truth. It is one. Why did the prophets come one after another, after a different period of time? When the truth had been usurped and altered by someone, another prophet would come, and he would bring the same truth and talk about the same things. But the essence of all these messages boiled down to the point that people should, first and foremost, love each other, live honestly and righteously, right? Right. Meaning, they were talking about building the creative society and about the easy path of coming to God. And they spoke simply, concisely and clearly. But, my friends, let's digress from the Judgment Day a little. I just want to tell you why it was done and why it all arose. Let's just imagine. 
especially those who are already versed and understand religions at least a little bit, as well as the essence of the Holy Scriptures, not of just one religion, but preferably several. So here arises a question. Why was the truth usurped and altered? We don't take the human factor, it's obvious, greed, simony and everything else. This is inherent in human beings. But why was it altered exactly in this way? Just so it would be possible to make it a state religion. Let's just imagine the truth brought by Jesus Christ, which was given to all of us, and in fact, it is the creative society in its purest form, yes. which should bring us to the ideal society. It is as the ultimate goal, Eden in the whole world. Could this teaching become a state one? Of course not. Let's say, would Konstantin, Vladimir and many others take the creative society as a state idea? An idea. Let's call it, pardon me, in a modern way, creative society. They surely wouldn't. Why? A king, a usurper and the like, a tyrant, and he suddenly takes something that should deprive him of his power and place him, the king, on the same footing as, pardon me, a stableman or a cook? Would that be conceivable? Surely not. It is inconceivable. What does an organization want? An organization wants money and power. Any organization, except Alatra. And this is really so, isn't it? Yes, it is. Here is the simple answer. That's why they took and altered it. And what do people want from religion? A simple question. Well, they… Life. Life. To live after death. Yes, some kind of guarantee. Because all of us, people, we feel that life in the body doesn't end at the moment of death of the physical body. And life in the body is temporary. We all feel and understand this. Almost all of us, except for maybe a very, very small number of people who are already, excuse me, really deep in Satan's anus. Those no longer feel anything. They got sucked down? No, digested. Right. What is also interesting is that, speaking about resurrection in general, when Jesus spoke, he said, I am the resurrection and the life. Yes. It was precisely said about spiritual resurrection. Certainly. Basically, about the fact that people who are asleep, who are dead, who are colors to the truth, to this God's love, who are dead during their lifetime, are dead during their lifetime. And precisely through him they gain life. This life is revived in them. And when he said, I, it is actually him. He is a representative of the spiritual world. Only through the spiritual world, only through it, only through love. Did he really say that you will come to God through hatred, worship, slavery or obedience? Was there anything like that? Was there or not? There wasn't. Through hierarchy, through something else. But what will a person come through? Of course not. You know, there is such a point. In fact, Jesus always said that it is possible to get saved only through love. But then already… But did he say, Tatiana? Why I address Tatiana? She is knowledgeable in orthodoxy, in Christianity. That's why I am asking her such questions. Did he say that one should be afraid of God? Of course not. And did he say that people are God's slaves? They are free, they are friends. What did he say? I no longer call you slaves. Yes. Right? Now I have called you friends. Yes, and you will not be slaves. Why? Those who love Christ, who love the spiritual world, become friends. They become a united world. And we can be slaves only to Satan. Isn't that so? It is. We cannot be slaves to God. This is wrong. But for an organization this is acceptable. For an organization it is necessary that we would be slaves, that we would fear God. Why? If we fear God, we fear his mediators. For instance, if we are afraid of a tyrant, we are afraid of his representatives as well. Why? Because representatives represent the tyrant, and they can do to us whatever they want. Right? Everything is very simple. The alive was covered with the dead. Or let's take a simpler point. Yes. Did Jesus Christ say that there should be a hierarchy, power or something else? What did he say? What did he talk about? That all brothers are equal, inequality. And nobody should be superior or inferior among you, right? Or inferior, yes. Isn't this what Jesus Christ said? So, where have the words appeared, excuse me, in the Bible, that the entire power is from God, my friends? Did Jesus Christ actually say that the entire power is from God? Oh, it's such an acute subject, yes. It is not really acute, 
it is a proper subject. Hence, if we have endowed somebody with power, while we endow someone with power, pardon me, sometimes by our choice, sometimes by foolishness, and the one whom we endowed with power becomes a tyrant, he starts usurping us. Should we agree with this and live to his tune, because God gave him power over us? But this is actually our choice. We are responsible for the one whom we begot, aren't we? What does God have to do with that? Right. For me, this concept is closer as well, that authorities exactly reflect of course. that state of society and that moral choice which is there. After all, everything that is inhuman and everything that leads to death belongs to Satan. Everything that gives life eternal, everything that begets love and gives joy in this world belongs to the spiritual world. Isn't that so? It is. Everything is simply divided. There is, pardon me, what is white and beautiful, and there is what is black and dead. Everything is simple. But, unfortunately, everything is altered, everything is distorted. So, the point is exactly in removing these distortions. People say, what's the point and what's the gist? This is the point and this is the gist. Again, going back to that very God's judgment, as they say, it is actually said that the alive ones will not be at the judgment. How can an alive one be judged? It is dead who will come to the judgment. And here a question arises. How come the dead will come? But didn't the messenger say that a human undergoes two deaths? The first one and the last one. The second death. But the alive ones do not die. Didn't the messenger say they did. that an alive one doesn't die? He ascends to God. Isn't that so? It is. Precisely in the revelation of John the Theologian, it is said that, it is said in an interesting way that death and hell gave up their dead. Death and hell, yes. They were thrown into the lake of fire. That's how the second death came. This is certainly such a… Of course. It is impressive. It's impressive, yes. Going back to Christianity again, I also like how people are forced to believe in resurrection in bodies there. Remember such a point, that if we deny that at God's judgment we shall rise in our bodies, yes. hence we deny that Jesus Christ rose in His own body after death, right? Right. Hence, we deny what? Then we deny Christ, and then we deny God as well. Isn't this what is said? Yes, exactly, such a chain. Right, but let's look at this logically, pardon me. We are actually slightly educated people. We read a little bit and we understand a little bit, don't we? Jesus Christ was in His own body after three days. He was in His own body and showed fresh wounds to His disciples, didn't He? So, resuscitation had taken place, speaking modern language. But later on, manipulating this point, they explained to us that we will be just like Jesus Christ. Yet, what if a person died 5,000 years ago, for example? From his body, it all has already been mixed in us. How is that possible? And here, reasonable people, excuse me, have a dissonance in their heads, right? What kind of fairy tales, yes. But these are fairy tales. Fairy tales from people who were far from Jesus Christ, who didn't listen to him and didn't share what he had brought. They didn't live by this. They only wanted power. They only wanted money and glory. It's all they strove for. While Jesus Christ didn't want either money or glory, He brought the truth and gave it to people. And He said that you should be equal. No one should be either superior or inferior. And you should love each other, my friends. Then everything will be fine. Isn't that so? It is. Also, regarding resurrection in this body, you mentioned Paul's words. And really, I'll put it this way, the architect of this doctrine of resurrection in the body is actually Paul who systematized and collected it all. And already after him, in the 2nd, 3rd and 4th centuries, more details were added to these stories about resurrection in the body. And they say what is actually heard today. What is the purpose of this resurrection in the body? They say that the body took part in the creation of sin. So it is not only the soul that has to be answerable, but the body must suffer as well. Do you know why they say that? Because they don't know the essence. The truth has reached us, and it goes from ancient times. There is a body, and the body must be alive, and the dead one will rise in the body. So how? How to explain this? You cannot take it away, because it will happen, that's a fact, and it has been talked about. And they cannot explain it. 
So these architects of fairy tales start these different stories. Well, we can call them stories too. But I like it very much. I'd like to share some lines from the Bible, where it is said about the end times. All the arrogant and every evil doer will be stubble, and the day that is coming will set them on fire. But for you who revere my name, the Son of Righteousness will rise with healing in its wings, and you will go out and frolic like well-fed calves. But I would certainly like to quote now the non synodal translation. It's again distortion. Yes. It's actually distortion and a lie. My friends, here it is from Malachi, I guess, isn't it? Yes. Yes. So the distortions here are substantial, which change everything. It seems to be a trifle. Read it again. Listen carefully, friends. But for you who revere my name, the Son of Righteousness will rise with healing in its wings, and you will go out and frolic like well-fed calves. Well, my friends, Tatiana will read it now the way it actually sounded, and not the way it was altered. Why do I say that? Because a great essence has been altered. Listen carefully now. I would like to read exactly the key points based on the Septuagint translation, which is close in meaning to the Church Slavonic translation. Shall the Son of Righteousness arise, and healing shall be in His wings, and you shall go forth and bound as young calves let loose from bonds. Is there a difference? A great one. A huge one. And you know what's funny? Those who are in Alatra and understand it indeed, they got it. But if someone just listens about Alatra, they don't know what it is. The sun with wings that will rid of bonds. Absolutely right. It will not change anything for them. And you see how important it is to know the essence and to understand. And the value of Alatra movement itself is that we, all together, all of humanity, are nevertheless getting to the essence. We are looking for that essence. After all, the sun with wings is Alatra. This is what has been symbolically portrayed. The Alatra sign yes. means God's love. Indeed. And it will rid of bonds. It will rid of bonds. Mm -hmm. Or you will be a full bellied, fatty, well fed calf. Yes, exactly. There is a difference. Are you a cheerful, free calf? Or do you lie on a couch overweight? In my opinion, the difference is huge. I apologize for the jokes, friends. When you encounter such things, humor is very helpful. Igor Mikhailovich, we just talked about Judgment Day, and we would also like to discuss what we already observe nowadays, that indeed we are living in the end times. For sure. And all the signs of the judgment hour, the last hour, as they say in Islam, are present. Right. Nobody knows when this will happen. Yes. But what is implied by the point that nobody knows when it will happen? Mm -hmm. It is actually implied that the final choice will still be up to people. Why? Because it was said, God knows when the live ones will judge the dead ones. Meaning, we, who are now living, determine not just our destiny, but also the fate of those who died before us. All those who died over the last 6,000 years. Again, why? We can run into a long conversation. Let's just briefly explain a little bit. If there is such a desire, of course. Of course there is, for sure. Okay, let's go step by step. What does it mean that dead ones will rise in living bodies? We already discussed this more than once. Not what Paul and his followers actually spoke about, and in various religions also. Yes, of course. But the dead ones will rise in bodies of the living ones. Is there a difference? A little emphasis, a substitution, and that's it. And it changes everything. Indeed. What we will now say mm -hmm. may sound as something new or as fairy tales for someone or something else. But this was mentioned a long time ago. And people knew that at the end of times, when, you know, 
let us first talk about the end times, about their signs, and then we will tell people about judgment. Okay. Let's provoke curiosity in our friends. Friends of mine, we should sort this out, because we have now started, we have again approached what is essential, the very meaning and essence of this last hour, but we haven't discussed its signs. After all, we are really living in those times, in the end times, when we, the alive ones, will actually judge the dead, including ourselves as well. Look, what kind of God's grace and what kind of love He has for us, that He has given our destiny into our hands. What does Satan do? He always strives to shift responsibility onto someone else. We are ready to believe in anyone, in the Comforter, in Imam Mahdi, in Masha, in whoever else, to shift responsibility onto anyone so that he comes, does something instead of us and decides everything for us, while we will submit to destiny. Whatever they decide, that's how it will be. Guys, no one will do anything instead of you, because the Lord Himself has given you the right of choice to live or to die. And now, I guess, we will talk about the signs of what we are approaching. You know, I would like to tell people even more. I would like to talk about the sign, which will occur literally in several days, and how important this is. But let us go step by step. Looking at what is happening in the world today, we really understand that we are living in the end times. And all the signs of the last hour indicate this. For it was said, particularly in Islam, that the Messenger warned that Judgment Day will not come until there are many earthquakes. It was said that there will be a pestilence that will mow you down like cattle. And here, in particular, there is an interesting point. It was said that there will be an epidemic, which will destroy you, like the disease quas alganam destroys beasts. So what is interesting is that this quas disease affects an animal's upper respiratory tract. And I think true Muslims understand perfectly well what's going on in our world right now. It is also interesting that once you said in the videos that there will be such disasters on Earth, that the living people will envy the dead. That's right. Indeed, one of the signs of the Judgment Hour, which the Prophet Muhammad pointed out, is that a man, when passing by a grave of someone, will say, would that I were in his place. And, unfortunately, he will say this not because he wants to meet Allah as soon as possible, but because of the severe calamities that… That will happen, yes. …will happen. However, I would also like to touch upon… This is one variant of the course of events, but there is another one. Yes. This is really so. The signs of the last day that are actually happening now are numerous. We have started talking about it, we have provoked curiosity. We have mentioned a certain sign a bit earlier. It is really the key moment that will happen literally in a few days after you watch this video. It is the future for us now. But soon it will become the present and then the past for everyone. A very significant event will take place. I would say it is pivotal. And it changes the whole world drastically. Many, of course, will perceive it that event as something unserious. But soon the whole world will know about it, and all people will understand its importance, the importance and the value of this event. But what people will choose is still up to people. It is their right of choice, granted by God. Well, let's talk about this event. Let's do it, it's very interesting. I understand that we are already provoking curiosity. Guys, we didn't mean to. It's just that we want to tell you a lot and not miss anything. We want to be clear to you, so that you understand the importance of this moment and the importance of what is really happening right now for the entire humankind. This 
is not a play on words. Its effect that is hard to understand by means of consciousness. Why? Because it concerns the issues of metaphysics. Indeed. Let's look at the event that is going to happen, mm -hmm. literally, in a few days. What is its importance? The importance of it, and the key point, is that the world will change. It doesn't mean that something will change drastically or anything. Some people will treat it, you know, sort of unseriously. They will say, well, people from all over the world have gathered. Yes, they have done something, but it hasn't affected my life in any way. It won't be immediately. But that's the way God acts. Everything happens naturally, normally and gradually. The only thing that can happen immediately and quickly concerns a different event that might happen by people's choice. But it will not happen instantaneously either. Everything will collapse slowly and gradually, and so forth. This is not fear-mongering. This is what our prophets talked about when they spoke of a different course of events that will happen according to people's choice and will. And it can really happen by people's choice. Either something good or something bad. However, the pivotal point in all of this is this very event. This event is something that was mentioned by the greatest of the Prophets, our all-human Prophet, the last Prophet, who in the same way should be a sign for all religions and should be precisely the sign. Why? Because in the primordial meaning a sign carries in itself the essence, the essence of an event. In the same way, the last Prophet is the essence of all events to come. And look, it's interesting that he was talking about our times. Back then he was talking about what is happening now, many centuries ago. This man knew and saw something that representatives of all humankind will implement into reality, literally, in a few days. How could he know that? A simple question. In no way, but from God. This is the ultimate proof of His greatness, of Him being the best among people, who really was and remains the best among people. He was the one whom God Himself chose. This is very significant. And He is our all-human Prophet. So, He said that the time will come when the Qur'an and all religions will be purified. What does it mean? It means that all people from all over the world will gather. But it doesn't mean that they will gather. It is extremely difficult to gather all people in one place. But there will be representatives of all humanity, and they will ensure purification. What is the essence of this purification? The essence is simple. Do you know what its simplicity is about? I'll try to explain it simply, precisely and clearly. There is God. God is one. And there are His messengers, who are bringing one truth. God cannot have different truths. He is God. And He always tells the truth. And this truth concerned us, people, how we can achieve that all of us, as humanity, become spiritually free so that all of us gain life not only after the death of our bodies, but already during lifetime, so that we live here, on our planet, like in heaven. Right? This is possible only when we fulfill the will of God and listen to the One whom God Himself has sent to us with His truth. Isn't that so? It is. However, Shaitan has changed this truth through his puppets, through his slaves. You cannot call them otherwise. And we started listening to a mass of dead people. Why dead people? I'll explain. Because an alive person is the one 
who loves God, who actually lives by the spiritual world, with love for God, and he will never dare change for his own benefit anything of what God has sent. While those who change the truth cannot be with God, but they have equated themselves to the messengers, put themselves at the same level with the Prophet himself. And they tried. Well, not just tried, but actually did it. They altered his words for their own benefit, interpreting what they themselves did not understand. Thus, we got lots of various stories from dead people, and they complicated and altered truth, which had been brought by the Prophet himself. Isn't that so? It is. So, the point is, that we must return solely to the words of the Prophet. We must listen to that truth which God has sent, while everything else and all mediators are not needed. A little earlier, Tatiana and I talked about simple substitutions. Just recall, my friends, that Jesus Christ said that all of us should be equal, no one should be superior or inferior, and we should all love each other. Later on, Dead people said that all power is from God. And other dead people said that there is a hierarchy both in heaven and on earth. Isn't this an alteration? Isn't this a distortion of the truth? So, people will tell the truth. And the truth is simple. They will gather and simply say that we should love God God is one, and all prophets are His. We shouldn't listen to anyone except them, and there cannot be any mediators between God and us except the messengers. If God wanted any one of those who told us… Well, I mentioned a little earlier that all power is from God or something else. If God wanted them to say so, He would have appointed them prophets. But he didn't come to them and didn't send anyone. It was Satan who came to them. And they referred to God and said what Satan whispered to them. So, can these people, who are, pardon me, I'll put it simply, who are deep in Satan's ass, can they teach us how to enter paradise? No, they cannot. Only the alive ones can teach us how to become alive. And the alive ones are those whom God sent. Those are our prophets. That's the point. Therefore, I would say it's the most important event in the history of humankind. When people, having united, will ensure purification. Yet it doesn't mean that everything will immediately be stopped. No, but everything will progress towards that, and everything will change, and the world will change quite rapidly. In which direction it will be up to us, to us who are living now. Why else is this event so important? Because it will take place when everyone on earth will be chosen. Chosen for this very time when everyone, both the living and the dead, will be facing this event. What does it mean, all the living and the dead? How can they participate in this? Perhaps we should talk about this too, because it directly concerns Judgment Day as well, as many other speculative issues, in which people have been deluded for the last thousands of years and do not find a solution to them. In fact, a human being is the bearer of both — hell and the gate of heaven. Each of you, my friends, is a bearer of hell and the gate of heaven. You should remember this. This is really so. Igor Mihailovich, you said that every person is the chosen one, because there is an understanding that many people say that there is one chosen people or another chosen people, that they have certain privileges or perhaps they have some kind of a mission. Again, why did this say the chosen people? For example, a prophet came, but he came to a certain people. Why? A prophet is a person. 
God's messenger in a human body. He cannot come into the dead world in the image of an alive one. No, it is impossible, because this world of ours, it… Do you remember, my friends? I'll go back to Tatiana's chamomile with the bug and the beetle that came to visit it. Remember? Well, to that world, to the world of that chamomile, bug and beetle, we can only come in some kind of an image too. Right? Can we, in our bodies, as we are, come to that fantasy, Tatiana's fantasy, which lives in the heads of all of us? Well, those who heard about this from previous videos. It's the same here. The Alive Ones cannot come into the world of the dead in the Alive image. I'm sorry, this world would disappear if they came in that image. They come in bodies similar to ours, just like all of us, humans. But they bring the truth, and they give it to us. And then the responsibility becomes ours, right? Is that people, which a Prophet came to, really chosen, compared to others? No. Responsibility? Yes. But chosenness? He actually came to everyone, to the entire humanity. A Prophet cannot simultaneously come to every person. Then the number of our people should at least be doubled. This is true. And again, there exist certain laws, according to which a body has to emerge. It has to grow up, and a certain time should pass before a Prophet will start speaking. There are certain laws here as well. The same is in this case. We are all chosen nowadays, because all of us who are currently living are those who are living in the end times. We are those who will witness the greatness of the last Prophet. This is a really significant event. And all of us are chosen, because we live in this time, while the responsible ones are exactly the Alatra people. It is the sun with wings. This is certainly remarkable information, in the good sense. It is. In fact, that every person who is living on the planet is chosen. Yet, is there actually an explanation to this? How have we all been gathered here? Of course, there is an explanation. There are explanations, and there are laws of physics. Well, not quite. Not our physics, no. So far we are… There are laws of physics which can explain this. I understand that we can enter into an argument, but only Satan argues, excuse me. And it's somehow futile to argue with Satan's slaves. It's not my lot to argue with Satan. Clear. But there are laws that determine why we are here. Indeed, everyone who once died, but didn't gain life, are with us. And here a very interesting thing begins. I understand that for some people it sounds like something new, and the like, what does it mean together with us, and so on. From time immemorial there was knowledge about subpersonalities, those who get into hell. Subsequently there were lots of alterations, a story about the after-death fate, about those who get into hell, and so on. We already talked about subpersonalities, and we talked about them more than once, where they are, who they are, and how they are. And you know, the paradox is that a lot of people feel and understand regarding those very subpersonalities that this is true. But consciousness begins to argue. Why? Because there are mindsets. We have to be somewhere, in some place. This place should be allocated somewhere. Where? On what planet? After all, dead ones cannot go beyond the Great Sphere, I mean our universe. They cannot go beyond it by any means, because dead ones remain in the world of the dead. They are subtle material structures, but they are material. Hence, they have to be aware between that world and this world. There is only one place between that world and this world, pardon me, in our universe. It is next to what every person possesses, next to the soul, and next to his body. Only there. So it turns out that around human souls there is actually a tremendous mass of the dead ones. Until an angel is born, until a person becomes spiritually free, precisely these dead ones accompany the rebirth of, let's say, the soul. It's not reborn, it passes from one body to another and carries with itself 
the personality of the one who died. Again, what is subpersonality? Subpersonality, well, a lot is actually told. And in these fairy tales of various writers of the past, a lot is told about what subpersonalities experience and how they live. Let's put it simply. It is us, without arms, without legs and without our bodies, but with our emotions, with an understanding of this world. Yes, we can hear, but we cannot see and cannot feel. Why? Because we feel. Our feelings, I mean, in this case, it means to feel the spiritual world, to feel love, to feel joy and to feel hope for tomorrow. Subpersonality doesn't have that. For subpersonality, it's an existence in that very hell. It's neither alive nor dead. There is torment, emotions, suffering and everything else. But for the dead ones, the second death that was mentioned, thank God this has been preserved in almost all religions, the second death is much more terrible. And having become a subpersonality, a person is aware, because he still has consciousness, and he is well aware of the situation in which he has found himself. He remembers and experiences every day of his life billions of times. He realizes that he could have changed something, but he won't be able to anymore. Every moment he waits for the final death, and it is very scary for them. What does death mean for a subpersonality? It would seem that death for a dead person shouldn't be scary. It is scary. It is very scary. It is scary, because any existence stops, and they feel it. Well, they don't feel it, they sense it, let's say, and they understand that it's inevitable. They will do everything to avoid this fate, because it is scary. Those who say that they are not afraid of death are boasting and lying. You know, it's like when a person is sentenced to be shot, he says, I am not afraid of death. But when he finally hears that it is the end, then the bravest one falls into a stupor. There is an expression that the shortest cigarette is the last cigarette. So, it turns out that annihilation is not liberation for subpersonality. It is death. It's an even more terrible situation for them. It is death. A dead one cannot gain life. It is unrealistic. Although a lot of legends exist. Well, people deluded themselves and invented those legends to justify at least somehow and give some hope. The state of subpersonality is what we earn during our lifetime. That's why it was said and explained. And people knew and understood that. That's why in the past, I mean more than 6,000 years ago, people used to live according to the laws of God. They didn't listen to Satan, because they understood that everything in this world during this carnal life is momentary, and there is nothing valuable here. What is valuable here is the time in which we can gain life, eternal life, and enter high society as an equal, to become an angel during lifetime and gain life. That's what is valuable and that's what is important. And they lived by human laws, as in the creative society, let's put it so. But when the consumerist format came, everything was altered, because this was scary. And this truth broke everything. Knowing this simple truth, a person will never act in such a way, so as to gain death for oneself. It is pointless. People understood, whatever you possess, it's not yours. This is true. So, annihilation is possible in two cases. It turns out that it's… In two cases. When a person gets liberated spiritually, attains it by working on himself. When a person really gains life, then naturally all subpersonalities that were before him with the soul get annihilated, and he merges with the soul, becoming a part of the spiritual world. This is the only opportunity. Excuse me, these are the laws. They are fractally repeated in our world as well. Therefore, that's true. And you feel it. And you know that not everything is that simple. But afterwards it was replaced with stories, fairy tales, and we forgot it a little bit. So, when a person embarks on the spiritual path, 
and really begins his spiritual mature path, the path to liberation, the path to getting out of Satan's slavery, to gaining life, subpersonalities always stand in the way, against, because it is death for them. This is one of the tests. A person has to step over subpersonalities. A person has to step over Satan. What prevents one from doing it? Subpersonalities spend their last energy just to interfere in consciousness. They cannot reach a human as personality, but they can enter his consciousness. And even when a person is quite mature spiritually, it's enough for him to get a little bit distracted by something material, to invest attention in wrong things, in the material, in the dead, and more than it's needed. Then attacks immediately begin, attacks from the system itself. In other words, thoughts cling to the material, a lot of unnecessary emotions, desires, and all the rest appear in a person, meaning he gets distracted, he is led astray from God. And if we talk about the second option, annihilation? When the second option takes place, it is precisely God's judgment, when it's kind of a common disaster, let's call it so the annihilation of this world. So, you've described the first case, how subpersonality actually hinders, how it wants to save at least its temporary existence by hindering personality. And you are now approaching a very significant event, because you and I, excuse me, all of us, have just been talking about the most significant event that was predicted by the greatest of people. So, after this event, the awakening of subpersonalities will actively begin. And the closer we get to the last day, the more active the dead ones will become, and the more they will interfere in the lives of the living ones. That is true. It's not fear-mongering, guys. It's not fairy tales. This is already happening. Why? Just to make it clear, we conducted experiments with the pyramid. If anyone remembers, it was about using symbols and transmitting information at a distance. And this really works. If you haven't seen it, watch it. It is on a Lotter TV channel. There was one phenomenon that many people discovered, sort of for the first time, but it was actually a natural effect. When, for example, the event took place, transmission of information by the operator on Thursday, but people received information as early as on Tuesday. Mm -hmm. How could people know? In advance. The answer in advance. Mm -hmm. They wrote it down, and the answer was absolutely correct. It means that time in the material world is linear. In the material world. Whereas when we talk about subtle material structures or go beyond ordinary matter, it is all gathered in one point there. It is different there different physics, different processes. As for those very subpersonalities, it is subtle material. They feel, understand and know, because for them it is an event that has already taken place. And the paradox is that over several years psychiatrists and psychologists, whom we know, have started asking questions and noting that there are more and more people who complain about sleep problems. Meaning, people have more dreams, active dreams, when they meet their dead relatives and strangers, masses of strangers, who swirl around in their heads. Over the last few years, more and more people have noticed that during the day they have thoughts with images of people whom they haven't seen, they don't remember them. Yes, I understand that from the standpoint of psychiatry and psychology, we talk to specialists, they ask me these questions, and just recently we had a similar conversation, and they try to explain this. It is clear about the year 2020, there is the pandemic. It's a difficult time, mental health is suffering, it's hard for everyone. And that could explain why a lot of such thoughts arise. But what about the year 2019, when everything was calm and this didn't take place? And it's all over the world, it doesn't affect some particular country. It's an effect that is noted all over the world. And it's noted to such an extent that experts have already noticed it. But they asked a question in terms of what's going on. Why do a lot of sick people appear? Those people aren't sick. They are just the type of people who notice the abnormalities which occur. Mm -hmm. Not all people can notice that. 
After all, a mass of people will not notice the dead ones, even when they are active. It's natural for them. Well, some faces are spinning around in their consciousness, they talk to them out of habit, many will be drawn into a dispute, a conversation, and the like. But why will the dead ones begin to attack the living ones? Precisely, so that the living ones choose life and not death. Subpersonalities will fight for their lives, and they are already fighting. Is it altruism? It's not altruism. Subpersonality cannot be an altruist. That's why it is subpersonality. It was an egoist during its lifetime, therefore it became dead. But that very annihilation is very terrifying for it. It's the end. It's darkness. Yes, the state of subpersonality is unenviable, it's torment and suffering, but it is life. No matter what it is like, it is life. Subpersonalities understand that they have no chances, but they don't want to die now, they want to die later. After all, consciousness remains the same as we have now. While we always try to postpone what is bad, and we want good things to happen faster, don't we, friends? We do. So this habit remains with us after death too. Therefore, the event which is about to happen is very significant. Does it mean that everyone will actually force us to move in direction of preserving life? You know, if it were more manifested, if dead ones rose from their graves like in movies, came and forced us, zombie apocalypse, then we would probably move. Right. But when thoughts come into one's head, many people will not notice this. Also, Igor Mikhailovich, in particular, in Islam it is said that believers' dreams will rarely lie before the judgment hour. Of course, this was exactly said about these times, that dreams will become truthful. Why truthful? This doesn't mean that there will be dreams that will tell you what will happen to you tomorrow. No, they will be truthful in the sense that dead ones will tell you that you will die. And this is true. The time will come, especially closer to the end, when, you know, as they say, whom you recall more often. After all, when we recall a subpersonality, especially if we know its image and name, this should be twofold. The more often we recall it, the easier it is for it. Our remembrance, our investment of attention is like food for subpersonality. So, the time will come when, well, let's say, a little bit of humor. Let's suppose those very Freud and Jung will actually pester psychologists and psychiatrists with their visits, pardon me for the blunt expression. While Isaac will start… Come into scientists. Yes, haunting scientists, throwing apples at them in their dreams and in their heads when they are awake. Again, saints will start coming to believers, first as heroes, and then, pardon me, not in regal garments, but in rags and without any nimbuses. That's when believers will also understand that these saints are dead. This will also happen. Everything will be purified. That is true. You know, we should still think about good things. Focus on something good and do what is good, while everything begins with our thoughts. Everything begins with those thoughts which we accept and which we implement. That's why even dead ones come. They come into our thoughts. The signs are coming, and what will happen is what will be. But I'll say the following. Those who are in God's love are not afraid. Those who are with God in their souls are not afraid. While those who are without God are afraid, because dead ones will cling on to them. This is true. When the dead turns potentially alive ones into dead, the world slides into the abyss. However, we can change a lot, friends. And in this is really our chosenness. The chosenness of today, of these times. We can, if we want to. And do you know what is interesting? We can do it, if we find common language with one another, if we begin to understand each other, and if we really want this, instead of seeing rivals in each other, 
or envy someone, or something else. Let's just roll up our sleeves, go ahead and make our world such as we want to see it. But if we don't change anything, it's our choice, isn't it? Then we shouldn't take offense at anyone and blame anyone, including dead ones. They made their choice, but they will help us to survive. The question is only whether we will hear them, despite the fact that for 6,000 years we have been listening to dead ones and we are living to their dictation. Will we hear dead ones at the end of our time? And will we be able to make the right decision in order to survive and give life even to the dead ones? Everything depends on us, friends, and there are no jokes here anymore. This is life, and no one jokes about life. We won't have a second attempt, and this is also worth thinking about. I liked it very much that at the beginning of our meeting you said that luckily no one knows about the day and the hour, this is what Jesus mentioned. Of course. And that there is a chance. We know in Christianity that what is certainly bringing this hour closer is that immorality which is in society. And as a Christian, I have an understanding that the task of every believer, in particular, the task of every Christian, is to do what they can, not just to sit and contemplate everything that is happening, those disasters which are taking place and what is happening in society, but to do their best in order to… To change something. Yes, to change something and to counteract, at least in some way, the immorality which exists to postpone the coming of this hour, at least somehow. You know, especially for believers, indeed, people, I would simply like to address you. Let us simply think, if you love God, if you are faithful to Him, really faithful to God, if you are faithful to the Prophet, really faithful to Him, then how can you violate His words? How can you violate His behest? There is actually no one between you except the Prophet, on the way to the Lord. Isn't that so? Then why do we listen to somebody? Why do we listen to dead ones, when literally in front of us there is the alive Prophet who has reached out his hand to us? Do we take our hands away from the Prophet's stretched hand and grasp at the dead ones, hoping that they will save us? Guys, isn't this funny to you? Igor Mikhailovich, it is so joyful that there are people who really act. A lot of people. And who feel this. And you know, you once said such good words, which stayed in my memory, that Alatra has done what has not been done for millennia. But isn't that so? Indeed. Several days will pass, and this event will take place. Over the last 6,000 years, such a thing didn't happen and couldn't happen. And it is now happening, just because science has developed. Mm -hmm. And we have technology, thanks to which we can gather. Mm -hmm. Why? Representatives of the entire humanity can gather in one point and purify the truth. Separating the dead from the alive, and thus liberating the truth. This can only be done by representatives of the entire humanity. This was said by the greatest one among people, wasn't it? It was. How could this be done without technical means? In no way. This is the answer why many religions have been standing sternly in the way of science. Many of them, but not Islam. And what is the greatness of the Prophet himself, the last Prophet, the best among people? It's in the fact that he developed science, at the time when other religions stood in its way. Why did they stand there? Because they knew the development of science would lead to an event when the truth would become accessible to everyone. And what would they have to do then? Go and work? But what about power? What about, pardon me, soft pillows and warm bathtubs? They actually got used to that. Yet, my friends, these warm bathtubs stand on our shoulders. And I would even say, not on our shoulders, they stand on our coffins. The price of these bathtubs is our life. 
So, should we be a stand under somebody else's bathtubs? Or should we become equal among the equals and enter high society? A simple question. After all, the choice is up to us. Great. Igor Mihailovich, you've also touched upon technology. Of course. I just want to say that people shared what they say regarding Prophet Muhammad, that only now our contemporaries can understand only now. what he was talking about. Only now. As a matter of fact, his words were unclear to people for centuries, while he actually spoke about our times. Right. When science would develop, that's why he contributed to the development of science in all possible ways. In fact, in his time, education became accessible to women, children and everyone. He took care of its development. I'll tell you even more. The whole world knows this, but we continue playing lies. Yes, you once said, and I was struck by that, how many facts are known when scientific discoveries of the past were shamelessly appropriated by people who simply… Yes, they took and translated what had been discovered in Islam hundreds of years before them, didn't they? And now we praise them, forgetting the true authors. Tell me, are we honest or not? We support these lies just like we support these warm bathtubs with liars on our shoulders. One might say, basically, on our coffins. Why do we need this? What's the point? Tell me. So here we have a choice. Will we remain stands under someone else's bathtubs? Or will we actually reach out our hands towards the stretch hand of our Prophet? A simple question. The choice is up to us, friends. And there is no one between us. It's only us who decide. This is the point of science, yes. Sunshine, that, thanks to its development, we can do what the greatest among people said back then, that this will happen, and it will be our significant event. He actually mentioned that shepherds will erect tall buildings. Of course. They will compete in whose buildings are taller, and that people will talk with the tip… Or the whip, yes. Of their whip, yes. And with straps on their sandals. Or with sandals. And how could this be explained? Or that his thigh will inform a person… Inform. …about what his family members have been doing. At that time, people didn't understand. Only now can we understand how this can happen. Could people understand this 200 years ago? Of course not. Of course they couldn't. And they couldn't understand understand this a thousand years ago. Yes, his words have been slightly distorted, but thank God they have conveyed this at least somehow, at least in some allegory, and have brought it to us. Of course. Right. I'd like to add that the Prophet actually said that the Imam of time will come, and he will be with his associates from various countries and regions, who will follow one goal, one for everyone, that is, they will act for the benefit of all humanity, and they will succeed to ensure that Mahdi wins, while Mahdi's victory, according to the Hadith, is the purification of knowledge and the establishment of God's kingdom on earth. Thus, I'll put it simply, Mahdi is living in each of us friends. The question is, just who will predominate in us? Mahdi, who will change the world for the better? Or that stand, that coffin under someone else's bathtub? This is what our entire choice is about. Look how simple everything is. When you remove complexities, everything becomes simple. We would also very much like to talk about the creative society, about building the creative society. You know, in Christianity, in particular in Orthodoxy, we were taught that love for one's neighbor is not just a feeling, that is a direct action, that we must help a poor one, we must safeguard a person against some dangers, and that, Generally speaking, they taught us a lot of things which make it possible to actually implement. It's not that we must. This should be our need. Right. It's not a debt when we owe something to someone. It should be our natural life. Didn't Jesus talk about the creative society? He did. Didn't the last prophet, the greatest among people, talk about the creative society? He did. And what did they talk about? They talked about the creative society. Yes. Guys, this is merely a name. These are epithets. They described how we should live. 
the Creative Society is just a code of what they talked about. It's a name which all of us have invented, in fact. Well, how can we call it otherwise? The Creative Society, building yes. of what the prophets really dreamed of. But they actually said that we should act this way and live like this. And who doesn't want to live like this? More than 99% of people dream of living like this in this world. Guys, but why dream, if we can live in this? Excuse me, I'll give you a very simple example. You are sitting in the kitchen, there is a refrigerator by your side, at arm's length, and you really want to eat something delicious from that refrigerator. So, you are sitting for two hours and suffering just because you really want to eat a cupcake or a sandwich. It is at arm's length. Why are you suffering? Open the refrigerator, take it and eat it. Isn't that so? It is. Of course, as an Orthodox believer, as a Christian, I can say that today only in the Creative Society is it possible to implement these principles of a true Christian and a true Muslim. Okay, yet, what does Muslim mean? Well, I know, let's say, there is a very interesting hadith. When the Prophet was asked who his family is, and he answered that every righteous person is from his family. Everyone who loves God? Yes. Is from my family. Everyone who loves God is from my home. We are all one family. Of course. We became divided, you see? Or rather, Shaitan divided us through those who take a bath on our necks. He divided us into Christians, Muslims, there is this constant struggle, the internal struggle, that very Christianity has been divided into so many branches. Yes. Islam has been divided. What are we talking about? And who divided them? The alive ones, faithful to the Prophet and Allah. Who divided our religions? Who, pardon me, distorted the words of our Prophets and why? To make it better for us or for themselves? A simple question. What were those very Prophets talking about? They were talking about the Creative Society. They dreamed that this world, which they devoted their lives to, imagine the best of us devote their lives to us. Who among you, friends, has devoted your life other than your children? Let's be honest, we devote our lives to our children so that they provide for our old age and so that we have someone to manipulate and control according to the laws of consumerist times to show our pridefulness somewhere or something else. Afterwards, when our children grow up and simply stop listening to us, we get nervous, because we forget that our child is a human being, and they have the right to choose their life. Isn't that so? It is. Yet, what do we want? We want to be obeyed and to be heroes. Power. Thus, this power and the pursuit of power by the dead ones, got in the way of the truth and humanity. Which the Prophets came with. And now the time has come when humanity can step over this dead phenomenon and come to their life. Isn't that wonderful? Of course. After all, when the Prophets came, they came to everyone. Yes and talked about this very message that people should live in love for each other. I have recalled that in Islam. For people to be people. Yes. I recall that in Islam it is said that the most beloved people for Allah are those who are most beneficial to other people, and the most loved acts to Allah the Almighty are those that bring happiness to Muslims. Of course. To do something, that is, to walk with my brother Muslim in his time of need, is more beloved than to stay secluded in the mosque for a month. Meaning, not just contemplating, not just praying, but acting and benefiting each other. Here, again, not just praying, because what does it mean to be one-on-one -on -one with Allah for a whole month, to be in His love? It is just the same love when you help a Muslim, yes. meaning when you help a person who loves God and not just contemplate. Because, again, it is unity with God. Isn't it wonderful? And do you know what the most wonderful thing is, my friends? I just want to say, 
Now we have shifted to religions a little bit. But the most wonderful thing is that even atheists understand and share what we are talking about. And the most interesting thing is that just a little more time will pass and there won't be a single atheist left on Earth in any of the scenarios of our future. Neither in the bad scenario nor in the wonderful scenario for us. There won't be any atheists left. Igor Mikhailovich, thank you very much. I would also like to touch upon Islam again, because, in its essence, Islam pursues its goal, basically, to put an end to all kinds of oppression and injustice that occur at the interpersonal level, in relationships between people, and similarly at the global level. I would just like to quote one hadith. When Allah's Messenger, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, said, Help your brother, whether he is an oppressor or he is an oppressed one. But how can I? A person asked. It's all right to help him if he is oppressed. But how should we help him if he is an oppressor, right? Absolutely right. Don't be his hand. Yes. Everything is simpler. You can help him by preventing him from oppressing others. And even more, when people see an oppressor but do not prevent him from doing evil, it is likely that Allah will punish them all. Of course. What does this mean? After all, it is us who are the hands of an oppressor. In this case, the Prophet referred to tyrants who start oppressing people. But they oppress people with our hands, ours. Whom can he oppress? With his own two hands, perhaps his wife. And only if she lets him do that. Isn't that so? If we stop being Satan's hands and tongue, the world will change. How much we all need the Creative Society. And it is great that in the Creative Society, we once raised it in one of our videos, it is said that all conditions will be created so that the worst qualities, some bad qualities in a person, will have no chance to manifest. For sure. And this is exactly the implementation of what? They should be eliminated from society. Yes. After all, everything is in our hands. And we can do it all. In the creative society, we should only encourage and do everything for the best human qualities to flourish. While everything that comes from the beast, which is unacceptable, should be eliminated. And everything will be fine, and the world will be beautiful. You know, Igor Mikhailovich, looking at the world we are living in now, you realize that people lack knowledge that the determinant choice is in their hands. Some people believe that everything is predetermined and nothing can be changed in their destiny. They just complain that… They kind of blame everything on destiny. This is our destiny. My friends, there is no destiny. If a person is with God, he is totally unpredictable. He simply leaves. It is the devil who made a life schedule for his slave. But that is not destiny either. It's a schedule made by the devil, isn't it? It is enough for a person to stop playing with his shaitan and really start loving God, and everything will change, literally everything. And life will change, because as within, so without. If you are a slave inside, if you live in evil, there will be evil all around you. Again, no matter how you look at it, if you want to change the world, start with yourself. Why? Because you can change a huge part of this world. Isn't it so? Because each of us thinks that he is a huge part of the world. So let's first change a huge part of the world, ourselves. And then let's change what remains, meaning the rest of the world. This is selfishness, friends. Unfortunately, but it is so. Each of us thinks of oneself as a huge part of this world. And by changing ourselves, look how easy it is to change the world. It is a joke, but it is true. It is important to realize that God has given people everything for their lives, but Satan has usurped it. Therefore, 
we should simply take it all back. He usurped it all through our thoughts, through our deeds. But every deed has a thought as a foreigner. So we have to catch Satan in our thoughts and cast him out of there. Then there will be no bad deeds. Look how simple everything is, if everyone starts working on oneself, if everyone refuses to serve Satan, God will reign in our souls and in this world. It is simple, friends, really simple. All of us, whoever we are, whatever religion we belong to, or if we are simply atheists, like many among us, but we want to live in a good, beautiful world, a world where God's love flourishes. After all, this is wonderful, even if you are an atheist, or, excuse me, where Satan's hatred dominates everyone. Which world is better? That is what I am talking about. I will put it this way. The biggest atheist in this world is a human being, but not Satan. It's a human who denies God for the sake of serving Satan, while Satan knows better than anyone that God exists. Think about it, friends. Yes, I want to live in a world where God's love and truth flourish. The truth is that together we can do everything, but alone we can only serve Satan. Don't forget that, friends. That is what Alatra is needed for, so that we would be together, and as our prophets bequeathed, would be equal, neither superior nor inferior, and treat each other with love. This is the meaning of Alatra itself. You know, as a matter of fact, this really significant event is taking place now, in our time. Its essence is precisely in the fact that we, people, we, humanity, turn towards our prophets. We turn away from Satan and turn towards God. Isn't that wonderful? It is really wonderful, friends. You know, it is really the event that will gradually change the world. I have been observing one phenomenon. Sorry, I'll digress. In my yard, I put one stone in the front garden, and it was just plain. I took, you know, one of those things, they call it moss, a kind of grass, and I took just a little bit and put it in a cleft. Do you know what I saw? I saw how it was growing. Eventually, it became a very interesting, beautiful stone. Little by little, just a little bit. But later on, it covered practically the whole stone. After all, it's enough to apply a bit of effort, and our planet will become green again, wanted, and beautiful as well. I mean both, from the environmental perspective and from the human perspective. It will become comfortable and perfect for life in every respect. And all of this, friends, is in our hands. For this, we need just a little, to apply a bit, a pinch of effort, and everything will change. That is true. There is also a very interesting understanding among Kabbalists that there are two times in the existence of the world. There is a time of work, and there is a time of retribution. Absolutely correct. And it's interesting that… Six thousand years enter the threshold. Yes, that time of work lasts for six thousand years, and then it is followed by the time of retribution. And what is actually the difference? How to describe this time of work? They say… In a simple way, six thousand years is the consumerist format. But in the seventh millennium, we should live in the creative society. guys. We are already very late. Look, we already live in the seventh millennium. And for quite a lot of years, right? Right. But still, in the consumerist format. Guys, Kabbalists told us that it has to be so. Think about it. But who will implement that? Who will implement? Yes. 
Indeed, the following is said. At this time period, meaning the time of work, evil inclination has power, and man must overcome this inclination to evil in himself. And indeed, the turn to the seventh millennium will be the time of transition from this world to the future world. In the future world, man will have a body, but neither body nor any other matter will have power over man. And this is the state the sages refer to when they say that God Most High will fashion wings for the righteous. People will rise above all their material needs. The very truth itself. That's what makes the Kabbalah great. It has preserved the knowledge of the past. That's what makes it great. But we are late. We should have had these changes at the turn of the millennium. But we were too absorbed by consumerist format. Your words are so memorable when you said that our generation will be either the first generation on the way of civilization development or the last one. Or the last one. You know, everything is fractal in nature. Because if we recall system science, they say that when any organisms or ecosystems or communities of organisms reach some critical point of instability, something happens to them. At the peak of their development, naturally, yes, such a moment, a point of instability is formed. Yes. Yes, and it is the moment of truth when a decision is made. Either a species transforms or it will be destroyed. So looking… The bifurcation point, yes. Yes. Humanity has really approached this point, and we all feel this already. We observe it, and there is no time for jokes anymore. We see that, indeed, people in the world are as if going crazy. Plus the climate and everything else in the world, the pandemic, all of these things are one on top of the other, and it is really manifesting itself now. Critical instability in society, yes. Absolutely. Therefore, one could say… And something has to be done. And guys, why do bad things, if we can do good things, right? So, it turns out that we, as humanity, are at such a global bifurcation point. Yes. And on our choice. We are facing our choice. And do you know what is interesting? Yes. How did the greatest among people know this so many centuries ago? A simple question. It is worth thinking about, friends. It is interesting when prophecies begin to come true, when history is implemented before your eyes, and when you are a participant in that very prophecy. Isn't it interesting? That is what our chosenness is about. And responsibility. And a huge responsibility. You are right. Therefore, my friends, let's be responsible responsible for our own lives and responsible for the lives of the past and future generations. Let's make the right choice and just start loving each other and do at least something good. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, friends.